we want to introduce the Bible because the Bible is the, the, is the main reference material, the main authority of what we will be doing in the ministry, like this. And throughout our lives, the Bible is going to play critical roles. The principles that build your, or the, the foundations for your life principle, your principles in life, the foundation for your operation, the foundations for your relationship with people, the foundations for your Bible, or for your marriage or for your family, your future, your destiny. Every one of these things are based on how you understand the Bible. The Bible is a very simple book, a communication between God and man, from God to man. It has the complete manual of your life and if you understand it, you will enjoy your living. So first we begin by saying that the Bible is derived from the Greek word uh, Biblia, or Biblia. But also the English version of Bible is actually also from, uh, said to be from the Latin word Biblia too, because it's also the Latin origin. And that's where you have the word Bible. And the real meaning of that is the book. The Bible is the book, implies the book. It's the book of books. There's no book as widely read, widely studied, widely published, like the Bible. It's a collection of these uh, divine inspirations, inspirational writings, things in which God breath on people, inform them and empower them, giving them that ability to put those things down, not by their own strength or by their own might. So it's more about God's inspiration, God's own personal expression, His words put out to His people. We have several translations of the Bible today. Over The Bible has been translated over 200 and 300 times as of uh, 2002. You have over, we had about uh, 200 plus translations on the Bible, translated into different languages. Even our own native language has translations of the Bible. We have the Biblio translations and the epic translations, even up to that depth. The New Testament translations are over a thousand translations of the New Testament. And you have even more translations of portions of the scripture like the book of John, translated many more, more times. We also have like the translations in English. We have very much, very many translations in English. Like the King James Version, the Good News, the Revised Standard Version, the Young Literal Translations. All of these are translations of the Bible in English. But I must state at this point that none of the core message of the Bible is lost in this translation. If you understand the central theme and the central message of the Bible, you will realize that the main message of the Bible is not lost in this process. In fact, it's still there. The language communication could be different to the understanding of different people, but it's the same message. If God intended you to come, and God has said, I want you to tell my people to come, it could be spoken to the house of person as so the central message is not being lost, it's not missing. The acquired mind could respond to D, but the central message and the core message is not lost in the translation. Because that's often, some people think that, oh, because of the translation, we probably have lost, but we still have the same base on almost all of these messages. They're not lost. The central, the core heart of the Bible, like we will see, is not lost in these translations. The evil man will respond to beer, but he's still responding to the same central message or the same central word or information. So the Bible is, in, is intact, it's untainted. It's the way God intends it to be for generation to generation. As language, you know, metamorphoses, changes, as the language itself goes through changes, you see the Bible still gets translations that speak to the existing generation. And so you don't, you're not struck with just the King James version of the Bible. 
you have the options of reading the amplified version, you have options of reading the revised standard version, you have options of reading the new international version, and you have options of reading even the new King James version. At least I guess read of the go ahead ticket and a couple of other things which you might find there. So the original languages, like the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and uh, Aramaic. You know, some of the languages of the Chaldeans, especially uh, the scriptures, the books of the minor prophets, speaking of from the book of Daniel down, which were the books, the minor prophets, which are the eras of the books that were written in the era of captivity, in the period of captivity. So you find those minor prophets, a lot of those books were written in Aramaic and Chaldeans. The New Testament was mostly written in Greek. Mostly written in Greek. And so you could see some very unique things like uh, Joshua, which is the Hebrew version of Jesus. Even where made reference to in the book of Hebrews was called Jesus. So you understand that not every place you find the word Jesus even in the New Testament is directly making reference to Jesus Christ himself because Jesus is actually also by translation the same as the Hebrew Joshua, uh, Hosea, Yehoshua and, and the like and people could still be bearing the same name today because it also translates in the English version as Savior you know, it, uh, it, it translates as a savior, which is somebody who is to save people. That's how the name of Jesus is. You shall call him Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. So he brings salvation, soteria, soteria. He brings that to us. So, we begin by reading Second Timothy chapter, I mean chapter 3 verse 16 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God, since the purpose of the scripture, that the man of God may be perfect you're not perfect because of your human limitations and frailty. But the scripture is given to perfect you. That a man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. One thing I like there is the, the singular terminology that is used in referencing and rendering the scripture. Rather than saying scriptures are given, it says all scripture is given. Because all scripture... Genesis to Revelation is one, agrees in one word, together. They are not contradicting themselves. They only can contradict themselves in the mind of the interpreter. But they don't contradict themselves in the spirit, in the inspiration itself. If you look at the core thing, by wrong interpretation, you will find conflict. By proper interpretations, you will never find conflict. All scripture is given, so it's a unified thing. The Amplified Version renders it this way, Amplified Version. Every scripture is God breath, given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction. Very good for giving instruction, whether to children, also workers, also believers, even people in, in, in secular society. They take instruction from the Bible. Government have formed their constitutions and their policies based on the principles of the Bible. It's the Bible that actually is the backbone of morality. The principles of morality are based on the Bible. It says it's given by the Israel and it's profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness in holy living in conformity to God's will in thoughts 
purpose and action so that the man of God so that the man of God may be complete and proficient well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work that's the amplified version the man of God will be fully equipped for every good work so you can you see him beginning to do good things and manifest good things because he's a word based person his, his life is powered by the word of God now the good news the good news also follows suit said in the same thing if I all scripture is inspired all scripture singular is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth is useful for teaching the truth rebuking error correcting faults correcting faults and giving instruction for right living giving instructions for right living so that the, the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. The person will be qualified to do every kind of good deed. Amen. Amen. So, there are, a, it's, it's very clearly stated the purpose that the Bible is giving to us. And if you look at the benefits, if you look at the, the purpose as detailed in this scripture, nobody would want to stay away from reading the Bible. Because it gives you the privilege to correct your faults, correct your errors, fix things that are not right in your life, in your neighborhood, in your environment. If countries, if cities, if companies, if people are to live with these kind of principles, you will have less mistakes, you will have less faults, you will have less sins, probably not even any, if we are to live and to abide by the principles that are contained in these words. So, who, who authored the Bible? The writers of the Bible, who is the author? A few persons would say, we want to make reference to people like Moses, Paul, Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Yes, you, could, you are talking about the human vessels, more like the pen in the hands of God. You are talking about the human vessels that God used to write his book. There are many ways to write a book. You must realize that the Bible is the inspired word of God to man and all his creatures. All the information that are provided in the Bible are all from God. They are all from God to humans. All from God to humans. All from God to man. All from God to us. God communicating his word to what? To who? God communicating his word to us. Now how is it done? How is it done? There are a couple of ways in which a writer would want to write. One of the ways that a writer could probably write and put together a book would be that he takes the pen and starts drafting the original manuscript himself. That method works and a lot of people do that. They either sit beside their computers or their typewriters or they pick up their pen and they pen down the original manuscript of their book. Yes, God also did that when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. The Bible said that he, with his finger, he wrote and carved out those stones that he gave to Moses. So, a writer can at the same time write directly and publish his manuscripts. Second option could be a more modern age method of doing it. A more modern age method of doing it is that in order not to lose touch of the information or the message or the insight, the writer takes up a handy recorder and records his presentation, his teaching, and the things that he wants to give out. When he does that, he puts those things in tape so he could return later 
play it back, listen to it, and then put it down in writing. Or you could send that to somebody that could probably listen to it and type. The writer can do that. The third method, which really works a lot and is used in most of the courts today. In most of the courtroom, while the trial case is going on, there is this typist, stenographer, this lady or a guy perhaps, very fast with a finger, with a little machine. Listening to every case, listening to everybody talking, listening to everything, and striking with his fingers and her fingers and typing like, literally typing almost every proceeding going on in court. In every legal formal court, you find those persons there. If you want to quote that piece of work, who said it? You're not going to quote the typist. You will quote the lawyer or the witness, the plenty, the accused, the judge that said what was typed. Therefore, the typist is not the original writer. The typist cannot be misunderstood to be here. Who typed the work? Who put the work in print? Who put the word in, into writing? You know, you could look at yourself, you could say, yes, I, I understand that this work was done by Paul. But Paul was very much like a typist. And therefore, you cannot be mistaken to be the original writer of the scripture itself. Now, let's follow this simple physical possibility. God, as the original author of the world, comes out and narrates to his secretary. The secretary happens to be the person with the machine or with the pen. As he inspires the secretary with the words he is saying to the secretary, the secretary is writing. The secretary now takes this word and hands over to the publishers. The publishers publish. At the end of the day, the author's name is to be printed on the cover of the book. You cannot put the name of the publisher as the author. That would be impossible. You cannot put the name of the secretary or the typist. That will be impossible. You will put the name of the original source of the material. And the source of the material, the original source of that inspiration, remains God. And because God inspires the word, God is the original author of the scripture. And the human vessels that he used are very much compared to secretaries and are very much compared to publishers or secretaries or typists while the people who are putting these words into these translations that are readable and understand, uh, understandable by our generation are the publishers. So we find the real author of the work, then we find the secretaries or the typists, and lastly we find the lastly we find the last group of persons which are the publishers. So God is the author, Paul, Moses, Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all of these people are his secretary people in which he spoke to directly and gave information directly. And then you have the other set of persons that are the publishers, that those are the publishers of the King James and Good News Translation, a Living Bible, a Young Literal Translation, an Amplified Bible, and all, and, and the rest of them. These people are only instruments in the hands of the original publisher. So the illustration that I put there is on your outline already, on the second item on the outline where you can see it. So the holy men of God were more like the secretaries of God, which he conveyed and communicated his word directly to, and they took the minutes of it. They took the minutes of it with the history, with the events, because even the histories and the events and the things that happened, all of them, all of them put together, 
were scriptures. The life of these people put together were scriptures. So, in bringing these together, we are going to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For no prophetic message, I'm reading first of all from the uh, good news. For no prophetic message ever came from the human will. But, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. As they spoke the message that came from God. So who then becomes the real author? The one who is releasing the, the original source of the message. The original source of the message is, is then becomes the author. Amen. Amen. Let's read also from the Amplified so that we could have other, just have various translations so you can come up with the meaning of that text of the scripture. For no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it. So the secretary wasn't just, the secretary can't just get up and start writing minutes. He can't just get up and start uh, uh, putting together a minute. No, there has to be a meeting where the boss or the executive and group of other persons are going to have to talk. Things are going to happen that, is, that the secretary is going to eventually write down. No, for no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it to do so. It never came by human impulse. People were, no, just I feel like writing this, I feel like saying it. No, it wasn't so. But men spoke from God, who were born along, moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit, driven by an internal force, pushed by the Holy Spirit, compelled by the Holy Spirit to say the things that they said, to write the things that they wrote. Many things happened in their times, but only the ones in which the Holy Ghost moved them to consider as scriptures, those events that happened, and the Holy Ghost says, write this down. This is a scripture. This will speak to many generations after. They had the voice of God from things that happened. They had the voice of God from the things they saw. They had the voice of God from the things, the inspiration they received. And so every single thing that they choose out of the whole lot to pen down becomes the voice of God to our time. Including even prayers. It came prophecies for our generation. As the answers of those prayers continue to flow. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, New International Version. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you, those of you in our time, what will happen to your words in the next generation? How would the next generation read your word? How would the next generation read your writing? How will the next generation read your book? How will the next generation read your comments? Today, many of us, we actually have Facebook accounts where we go and dump comments and dump words and dump things and think that, well, we just said it. Generations after, we'll probably be having access to those comments. Those comments are never taken out. They will continue to stay looped, coming over and over, sometimes popping up, for as long as possible, those comments will remain alive. Will they eventually become like scriptures to your children's children? Will they eventually become like scriptures to generations after you. That's why you must learn not to speak purely by impulse. 
But a lot of times, speak based on inspiration. Speak based on insight. Speak based on the fact that the Holy Spirit is putting this deep inside of you to say. Men who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Men who wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These men are the ones who have eventually released the words that have lived longer than every other word. The songs you write and the songs you sing, if they are not inspired by the Holy Spirit and based on the Holy Spirit, what will happen to them a few days later? While some well-inspired hymns have lived from generations to generations, so many lyrics of well of us, you know, Oscar-winning songs, you know, songs that have won multiple Grammys, and a lot of those songs have faded off into oblivion because they didn't have inspirations for the generations that followed. They didn't have messages for the generation that followed. They just play around, love, love, this, baby, 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 that, 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 and they died naturally. While we still sing Amazing Grace till today, while we still sing a lot of these well-inspired words still speak, when you speak, when you write, when you talk, when you do things, it is encouraging for you to really walk with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because if you do, it will remain in the hearts of people, in the minds of people, and in the lives of people. Speak by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Write by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Put together information by the leading of the Holy Spirit. You'll be very surprised how much life, how many lives that one act alone can touch and can transform. So, on the last note, we see the library of the Bible as a library. The Bible itself, as chatted in the table below, is very much like a library. When you walk into a big library, you see these shelves, all these lineup of shelves. And on every shelf, you will find books on the shelf. And you can actually pick up a book and read. In each of those books, you will find you will find chapters. Chapters. The Bible's got chapters, the Bible's got verses. Some of them are even real paragraphs. Paragraph. And you can see them. Arranged. Titled. Subtitled even. You know. Neatly put together. Packaged. And so whenever you pick up a Bible, it's like walking into a library. A library full of of resource materials. The, the, the Bible is much more than that. Because this is, a, this is generation from generation to generation. This is, the, this is the highest living book. The highest living book. It never stops living. This is, a, this is, this is, this is real. Now the, the Bible, the Bible has 66 books in it. On its shelf, when you pick up the Bible, it's like you look at a shelf and you find this 66 books on two shelves. One of the shelves is a shelf of the Old Testament, and the other shelf is a shelf tag the New Testament. So you can find the Bible, then you have the Old Testament shelf, and then you have the New Testament shelf. Then on each of these shelves, you have sections. As it is in an average library, you have sections. One section contains the law books, the books for the laws inside the, the, the Bible there. The other section contains uh, history books. History books that speak of even the time of the children of Israelites as they, were, uh, as they were brought out of captivity and all. All those books as they moved, what happened to them, their, their, their emotions and all. The, these books are there, these history books beginning from the book of Joshua down. The laws are Genesis. To De Deuteronomy, then you have the history books beginning from Joshua right down to Esther. Then after the history books, you have uh, poetry. The poetry is the book of Job right down to the book of Songs of Solomon. Well, Songs of Songs of Solomon right down to the Songs of Solomon, and then you also have the next 
section of the Old Testament part, which is the major prophets. These were the prophets that spoke before the captivity. And their, the, their chapters and their books are lent here. And they also were written in the original Hebrew. Then, beyond them, after them, you have the minor prophets. A lot of them spoke at the period of the captivity. And those ones that spoke, some of them, their books were written in Aramaic, and some were written in Chaldean, the language of the Babylonians at the time, when they were in captivity. When uh, Israel was still in captivity. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament were books that came up also, which are not accepted as the con uh, canonical books. Canonical books, they, are, they call them the ap uh, apocryphals. Those books like Tiberius, like Maccabees, and a couple of them. Maccabees, some who consider them more as history books. Some of them are all because a lot of these books were not amongst the reference books that were in the, the if you look at the books and the quotes and the, and the references that the New Testament was built on and the apostles worked with, these books are literally not even part of those, 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 those materials. So they are not even considered, not just that our generation don't consider it, even the New Testament framework does not consider them. So you find that between those periods that you have the Old Testament and New Testament, there were a couple of other books. But they are not a part of our present day Bible. They are not a part of our present day Bible. Then you have the other shelf that contains the New Testament. When you go to the other category or department or section, then you have the New Testament books. Then you have the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you also have the uh, Epistles and Letters. And the epistles and letters are in two parts. You have the Pauline epistles, which are the epistles of Paul and the writers of Paul. That spans from the book of Romans right down to the book of Philemon. Then you have the general epistles that includes the book of Hebrew to the book of Jude, then the book of Revelation, which is the final last day prophecy, final prophecy. Uh, the book of Hebrew uh, doesn't have, well, a defined author because the writer did not just for very good uh, personal reasons or what, whatever the case might have been did not reflect his name in it at all and it's by replacement and all it has been assumed or supposed or believed widely that the book of Hebrew was either written by Paul because of the level of wisdom that is contained in it of which Paul exhibited at the time and the second possibility within the timing in which it was, I mean Hebrews, right, brother? And the second possibility of the time the book of Hebrews was written also was fell within the point that there's a, they believe is that it possibly could have been written by James. The reason is because Paul had his message more to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, and the book of Hebrews has a lot of information that is tailored towards the Jews and the circumcised. And again, it's also possible that Paul could have written it. But I believe also that there is a very good reason, owing to the persecution and the torture and everything that went on at the time of the early church. Anybody who is beginning to directly interpret the Mosaic law for Jews is tampering directly with Judaism. And so sometimes when you put together such a material, it sometimes wisdom directs you to leave your name out of it. And that possibly could be the case because the book of Hebrew was really targeted at re-explaining the Levitical priesthood, the, Jew, the, 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 the acts of the, the, the religions of the Jew, the belief of the Jew, and in, in fact, a, a complete relooking of Judaism in, by the eyeballs or in the picture of Christ or in the light of the existence of Christ. You know, Judaism exists in the absence of Christ as Moses and the prophets. But what if you look at this oppression in view of the existence of Christ? So, when you read the Bible, each time you carry a copy of the Bible, you're carrying a whole library with you. Every time you can pick up one of the books from the library and read, or pick up a chapter from a book and read, and every one of them will inspire you.
And the follow up to this, we'll be studying even more things later in other courses. We're looking at the beginning of the book in lesson one. In lesson two, we shall look at how to understand the Bible today. In lesson three, we will look at the Bible as prophecy. In lesson four, discussion and sharing Bible scriptures. How are you going to do that and how to do that effectively? Lesson five, the Bible and science and some strange facts and things that you have in the Bible. Just look around some very fine things in the Bible. Lesson six, we'll look at what to do with the Bible. And on the level, lesson seven, believers ask Bibles. So when you look at the fourth point there, you will see that the Bible has a central theme, and that's what I'm going to leave us with today. The central theme of the Bible is love. Let's look at the scriptures and see if we could pick out some of the the things the Bible. The Bible tells us to not go anybody anything but love. That's Romans 13 verse 8. Uh, we would read Mark chapter 12 verse 28 to 31. And one of the scribes came and having heard, heard them reasoning, I'm reading the New International Version, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So this form, love, loving God, loving your neighbor, these form the central theme and the base of the scripture. You know? So if you look at uh, Luke 20, you will see similar uh, references there being showed. Um, then you could look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 14. Let's read Galatians 5 14 lastly. Where you see the scripture that says, let's sum up the whole scripture. It said the entire law is summed up in a single command. Everything, everything you read from Genesis to Revelation, the entire law, the word of God, the Bible, all of it in its completeness, all is summed up, summed up in a single command. What is that single command? Love. love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. So love becomes the summation, you know, for everything. For the whole law concerning human relationship is compiled with in this in the one uh, precept in one precept. You shall love your neighbor as you do love yourself. So for all. The law is fulfilled in one word. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you ask, what's the central theme of the Bible? Central theme of the Bible is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In fact, everything you do, preach money, preach prosperity, preach healing, preach whatever you preach, in the absence of understanding law, you have lost a very core value in the understanding of the Bible. You need to understand that the Bible is first of all about love. The reason God is going to give you prosperity is because He loves you. The reason God is going to heal you is because He loves you. The reason God is going to raise us from the dead is because He loves us. 
The reason God allows you not to perish in sin is because He loves you. The reason why you're going to live in peace with your brother and sister is when there is law. The reason why you will forgive is because you love. The reason why you got forgiven is because you were loved. Everything that you're going to read, whatever you're going to believe for, get, gain, whatsoever, is one way or the other still going to boil down to that principle of love. Now abide it, faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of all these is what? Is charity. Amen. Amen. So the believer has a great tool, and that is the Bible. And the Bible in the hands of a believer is much more than a library full of canal books. Because the Bible will equip you, will make you perfect, will take the errors out of you, and make you even a much more better person. Now, the few of the scriptures that I have quoted are not currently in that outline. So I hope you did take them down so that you can make reference to them on your own, read them, and then, and, and then you can ask them for questions. If you want to make comments, on the lower right corner of that outline given to you is a believer's response uh, section box there where you put your name and your mobile and then you can send a question across that we might consider in upcoming answers uh, meeting, uh, answers service. We'll be able to look at that and give you information, you know, that are in relationship to the things in which you ask. So thanks for being around this evening. But remember to inform other people, your friends, your colleagues, and tell them we are studying something very deep in here and we're going gradually and our tool is the Bible. It pays for them to be around, reach out and see how you can talk to them and they can probably join us in this in-house fellowship, in-house church as we get started gradually as we run it. It's important for everybody to be informed so that they take advantage of this time and really understand what the Bible is to them rather than having to carry the book around them and not know what it means and think it is just one of those books in their shelf. No, the Bible is not one of those books in your shelf. The Bible itself is a library of books. It's bigger and it's bigger, higher, and in the higher grade of placement than every book in your shelf. If you have one Bible in your shelf, then you have just put a library in your shelf. And not just a library, a divine library, a heavenly library, and an eternal library. Amen. Let's rise up and pray.